turn with me to Acts chapter 16. Acts 16. When I think of the letter to the Philippians, I think of jail to jail. What do I mean by that? Jail to jail. Well, Paul went to jail in the city of Philippi, and then he wrote an epistle to the Philippians from a Roman jail. Can any good thing come out of jail? Yeah. Really can. And it's really, it's really quite amazing. Jail, the jail to jail epistle. So Paul was put in jail and then wrote to the Philippians from prison. And so this was something that was a truth in his life. Circumstances that happen. And sometimes when you think about your situation, maybe you feel like you're in jail. Are you with me? Hmm? And uh, health, finances, marriage, family, whatever it may be, before you know it, you could think of yourself as being behind bars in your situation. And yet, when you praise and pray to God, an earthquake takes place and the foundations of the prison are shattered, and out you come, and people get saved and a church starts. So really, this is an amazing epistle. The overall emphasis on Philippians is the sufficiency of Christ, the life of Christ. That's our convention theme this year, for me to live is Christ, the life of Christ. That was Pastor Stevens's verse in his going on to be with the Lord service for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And so it is really an awesome book with awesome truth in it and all about the all sufficiency of Christ. And we can see the prelude to this in the scriptures when God would say in Genesis chapter 17 to Abraham, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be perfect. And he would say in the Hebrew language, I am the one who is your sufficiency and it's only I that can satisfy you. El Shaddai means sufficiency and satisfaction. So he had to learn that many times God allows certain things to happen in our lives so that we will draw near to God and see Him as our sufficiency. If our sufficiency in 2 Corinthians 3, 5 is of ourselves, God lovingly allows situations to show us where our sufficiency is. He really does. And when you think about the children of Israel in the wilderness and what took place in Egypt and how they were delivered, they had to look to the all-sufficient one, that God is our sufficiency. And when I look in the direction of man, myself, situations, governments, all kinds of human initiations, and I find that there's no sufficiency there at all. And I look to God. I look to God. So the Church of Philippi, the sufficiency of Christ, and this is really the key. It's like Jesus Christ, uh, the sufficiency of the Philippians and of the Apostle Paul himself. And this is key. So we're going to start in Acts chapter 16. And I love how all of this took place. And Paul was a man of God who, because of the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, was always going. I think this is a key. You know, when Jesus said, I'm hearing voices, is this a translation? 
Okay, just try to keep it down on the translation if you can. If I can hear it, then it's a little loud. Uh, <laughs> Paul, and it's distracting me a bit, but I want you to do it because we love those people that are being translated to. But when Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, and Matthew 28, 18 through 20, go, he really didn't say go. He actually used it in a tense that was continuous. And it was going. Going. So that it wasn't like you should go someplace and stop. But you should be going. And I believe that the person that's always going in many different ways that can be. I mean, it doesn't mean I have to leave one church to go to another. But in my mind, I'm always going. I'm going in the aspect I want to grow as a believer. I'm going in the aspect that I'm a part of a church that wants to reach the world. So it's going. It wasn't like G-O with a period after it. No, dot. G-O dot stop. It was just keep going. And really, I think a lot of Christians have a lot of problems. Not all of our problems are based on this, but I think in my life I've seen problems when I'm not going. If I'm going, I'm not occupied with what's behind me, my past situations, problems per se, but I'm ju I just have this attitude of going in the grace of God. And this is really, really very important. I think a, a standing still target, as we've said many times, is very easy to hit. A moving target's not easy to hit. So if we are standing still in our faith, in our Christianity, and our walk with God, we become a great target for the enemy and his flaming missiles. But if we are a people that are going, you know, sometimes I hear people say like, well, it's amazing how many doors God's, God has opened for Pastor Mati, Pastor Schaller, this one and that one. I wonder if the reason is that they're always going. And if you're going, there's going to be something opened up. By the way, you might get your face pushed in a few times in the plan. Broken nose and stubbed toes. There's nothing wrong with a broken nose and stubbed toes. I'd rather have a broken nose and stubbed toes than uh, be going no place at all. And I really believe if you look at the church that's going, the church and the Christian that's going is always going to be under attack. Why would the devil have to attack something that he controls? He doesn't need to. So if a church or a believer doesn't think about going, doesn't care about going, is not concerned with it, then basically the devil doesn't have to do much of anything with that person. He's got them. He's already taken them captive at his will. He's taken them captive at his will. But a person that's going is a threat. A person that's in a church that's going is a threat and a threat to the kingdom of darkness. And so if you look at the book of Acts, you'll see every time they made steps to go, they were met with tremendous opposition. In Acts chapter four and five, they were jailed twice. Whatever happened to Christianity, by the way? I wonder, you know, it's just interesting to me. Like they were jailed twice, Acts four, Acts five, by the Jerusalem authorities and the religious people. They made a move into Samaria in Acts 8, and they were met with Simon the sorcerer. They had some trouble in Acts 8, didn't they? Acts chapter 13, they took their first step into Galatia. They were met by Ilimus the sorcerer, who, attacked, by the way, he attached himself to the deputy council of the island. How's that one? Demons are attached to authorities to control them to be anti-gospel. In Acts chapter 16, the first adventure into Europe, Paul is met by a woman with a spirit of divination. Right? Acts chapter 19, the first thrust into Asia, seven sons of Sceva. Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? So the activity of the enemy, the open door is always accompanied by activity of the kingdom of darkness. So never get introspective or think you're doing something wrong when you're under attack. You're probably in the perfect plan of God. And don't get upset about it. Because you can get so upset you could pull yourself out of the plan. And then you won't be under attack and you say, 
I found this great church and there's just no trouble there. Good. Stay right there. That's okay. Settle in and settle down. And build yourself a nice little life. But that's okay. But a going life, and you can see as we look to Acts chapter 16, going life, people with a going life might have problems in their marriage, might have problems with their family, might have financial problems, might have uh, personality situations occur. And it has nothing to do with the fact that they're going. That's all that it is. And they become introspective and think they've done something wrong. Now, if we've sinned, we've sinned, we name it, and we confess it, and we go on with God. But I'm not going to sit back and think that every time something happens, what did I do? And examine myself outside of God. I'm not going to do that. So in Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 5, and I want you to see something that's very interesting here about how Paul was just moving. And we will get to Philippians some point this summer. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking for all of you students of the Bible that want to have a curriculum and like, you know, make sure that I go verse by verse or something. It's not happening. You're in the wrong Bible school. No, I will, we will cover Philippians, believe me. We've got 10 weeks and uh, 10 Friday nights and we will get through it by the grace of God if we're all living. If not, we'll, we'll, get a, we'll have a better understanding of it in heaven. Verse 5, So were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Acts 16, verse 5. And when they had gone throughout Phrygia, don't you like, I just like how that, I just was looking at that tonight. They've gone throughout Phrygia. They're just going, you know. And they're, they're leaving no stone unturned. They're going everywhere. You know, we're in a country and we have, to have a desire to just going everywhere. You say, I, I thought this was about Philippians, not missions. This is how it starts, okay? Uh, don't worry. You know, just take it easy. Don't enter into self-analysis. Live in who God is. And when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel in Asia. Isn't that a good verse? They were told not to go to Asia right now. You are wrong men, wrong time. Okay? Later on, Peter was right man, right time. Wrong man. Are you listening? Wrong man, wrong time. Wrong man, wrong time. They were forbidden by the Spirit. So many times the Holy Spirit stops people. But you won't know anything about being stopped unless you try to go. Someone that doesn't try to go uh, has always stopped. So when you're going, you're so sensitive to the leading of God, you can be stopped forbidden by the Holy Spirit, okay? To preach the word in Asia. Then look at verse 7. And after they were come to Mycenae, they essayed to go into Bithynia. I, I like that. It's like an interesting, it's an interesting word. They essayed, they were, they were, uh, they attempted, they made an attempt. They got stopped, but they're still making attempts. They attempted, the word is attempted actually, to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit, what? Suffered them not. Forbidden, and then suffered not. And they passing by, they say, you know what, I've had enough, I quit. I tried to go this way, God said no, I tried to go that way, God said no, I'm going back. No, they kept going. They kept going. And they were come to Mycenae, they essayed to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mycenae, came down to Troas. And I, I love this. So you can see them in verses 6, gone throughout, verse 7, to go, and we'll see in verse 10. They just had an understanding of what it meant to be a going people. And otherwise, there would be no Philippians book, would there? If they, if they never went, if Paul never went in Acts 13, there would be no Philippian epistle because there would have been no one to write to. Hello? Does that make any sense? If there was nobody to write to, there wouldn't be a Philippian epistle. But because he was going, something took place in Philippi. And then he could write a letter to them. And here, here we go. And there's some interesting words here that I want us to see. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, 
saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. Pray to him. What does that mean? Interesting word, parakaleo. It means encouraged him, invited him, beseeched him, exhorted him to come into Macedonia. Not just, I'm having a prayer meeting, I'm praying that you come. The word parakaleo means he encouraged him, begged him, had a desire for him, and exhorted him to come into Macedonia. In the vision. Boy, I like those kind of visions. You know, you get some people, I had a vision that God gave me a wife. <laughs> well, I had a vision God gave me a husband. I had a vision God gave me a million dollars. I had a vision God gave me a new house. I had a vision, I had a vision, I had a vision. He said, I have a vision, and here's the vision. Okay, here's the vision. It's a, it's a missionary call vision. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him. You could even use the word beg here. Beg, encourage, beseech. Invite, desire, exhort. And prayed him saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. Now how many of we have we heard, we've read books, I haven't, but maybe you have read books about the Macedonian call. What we need is the Macedonian call. Really? It's interesting. I really believe because he was going, he would get called by God. He, he would be called in the way. Remember Genesis chapter 24, I being in the way the Lord led me. I was in the way of grace and truth. Some people never get called by God or they're, they're called by God, but they never hear the voice because they don't go. They never hear the voice of God. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, think about it. If I don't have a real, you know, um, I, I will be, Blunt with this. Talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. Feet move. That's what Christianity is all about. Talk is cheap, but feet move. All right? And so, prayed him coming over into Macedonia and help us. We need help. And I love this. And after, we had, after he had seen the vision, don't you love this word? This is, this is fanatical. Immediately. Oh, wow, wait a minute. Let me check with my, uh, with my wife. Let me check with my uh, husband. Let me check, of course, I understand that one. Let me check my finances. Let me check the mission board. Let me check, and I, we understand about going out decently in order, but immediately, why? They're already in the way they've already been sent by the church. It's immediately eutheo. And this is what the word means, immediately, eutheos. Instantly and straightway. Quickly and swiftly, instantly, swiftly, quickly, immediately, <laughs> straight away, not considering anything else, straight away I'm going to Bible school, hello, straight away I'm going to be a part of outreach, straight away I'm going to pray, straight away I'm going to love people, straight away I'm going to give, straight away, oh no, no, we are, we are myself included. We gotta think it over. Yeah, you just, you and I just keep thinking it over. You know what happens? We have cement shoes spiritually. <laughs> spiritually cemented shoes. And you know what it's like to walk with cement shoes? It doesn't work. It just doesn't work at all. Immediately, and I love this, we endeavor to what? To go. See, they're going. To go. Verse 6, to go, verse 7, verse 10, to go. That was what was on their mind. They were a going people. And immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. Listen to this word. And by the way, endeavored means we have a desire. The word is zeteo. When it says the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, this is the same word for endeavor. Seek. Seek. Z-E-T-E-O. -E seek. Have a desire and a purpose. We endeavored. This was our purpose. We came, thank you, God, for speaking to us. We, we, we went on the mission field. We went out because we wanted to know your will and your desires. And they endeavored to go. And look at the next part. Assuredly gathering. That means we were joined together with God's thoughts. We knew what God was saying. We joined God. Sum bebeza was the word. We are one with God. We are going. We are going. And you know what happened? 
You know what took place when they got there? I'm not going to go into all of it, but they ended up casting a, a ventriloquist demonic spirit out of a woman who made the statement, these are the sons of the Most High God, they show unto you the way of salvation. Paul said, come out of her. Sounded like a good testimony, didn't it? Listen, what would you do if somebody said, hey, you, were, you were preaching, hey, these are the sons of the Most High God, they show unto you the way of salvation. You say, thank you, want to join me? It was a devil. It was a demon. It was a ventriloquist demon. That's the words, python spirit is what it was in the Greek language. And Paul, out, out. He didn't have a three-day deliverance service like some people have, you know. We're going to have a three-day deliverance service. Fast, we're going to anoint you with oil. We're going to stand on top of you. Uh, we're going to make you stand on your head. We're, vomit, vomit. You're going to vomit the demon out. You know, all this crazy stuff that these suicidal people do. Why do I say suicidal? I don't know. It's like they're killing them killing themselves to please God through all of their own self-efforts. And but one fortunate, unfortunate thing happened, which was fortunate for the plan of God. The people that were like hiring her, they got upset and they made sure that they went to jail. They put them in jail. I also could call Acts chapter 16 the tale of two women. Lydia and the woman with the spirit of divination. It's like the tale of, you know, the, when you were growing up, did you ever read? I never did because I hated reading at that time. The Tale of Two Cities. Was that, was that such a book as that? Yeah. Tale of, I never read. What I would do is read the first page and the last page and pretend I knew something. And I always got away with it because teachers were stupid. <laughs> Sorry. If you're a teacher, don't be offended. I made it out, I'm telling you. So, and by the way, this is, this, is the, uh, this is the beginning of the house churches. I like the house churches here, don't you? This is the house church. You don't have to worry about electricity. You don't have to worry about anything. House church. Lydia is by our riverside, and she's praying, and Paul meets her, and it says that the Lord opened her heart. Now, let me say this just as a, another thing before we get to Philippians, because we are in Philippians. Now, what does it mean to have a heart opened by God? And it says that, let's just read that, verse 11. Let's we'll start there. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia. I'm in Acts 16, 12. And a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us. Listen to this statement. Whose heart the Lord opened. Whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So really, like I'd like to say, uh, just in this portion of Scripture, there is evidence about somebody's heart who's been opened by God. Okay? Number one, a heart opened by God, she loved the Word. She loved the Word of God. She was a woman who loved the Bible. Okay? She listened to everything that Paul said, the Word that was spoken by the man of God. Number two, it's very clear she was a woman of prayer. She was by the riverside where they were having a prayer meeting. Number three, she wanted her whole household to get baptized, to get saved and baptized. She was a soul winner. And number four, she said, have the church in my house. She was, she loved body life. There's four which, uh, of the evidences of, of what I believe is a person whose heart the Lord has opened. All right? Sometimes we meet people and say, oh, they were so open to God. Well, what about this as an illustration? They met her. She loved the word. She was a woman of prayer. She wanted to see people get saved. And she said, have the church in my house. Body life. So think about those four things. The Bible, the word, prayer, evangelism, and the church. Body life fellowship. 
This is what it means to have a heart opened by the Lord. All right? You know, a lot of times uh, in Christianity, we try to open people's hearts with a can opener. It just doesn't work. A lot of scars and pain. Okay? You pray that God opens people's hearts. When God opens a heart, its heart is open. Okay? When God opens a heart that you don't even have to, like, try to make anything happen. You just walk with God and they follow. They love the Bible. They love prayer in some measure. They're, and we're, we're all growing in that. They, they love the idea that people could get saved. They love church and fellowship. That's a person whose heart the Lord has opened. And I think as we are involved in missions all over the world, and even in the city of Baltimore, we, I, wanna, I want to see God open people's hearts. I mean, I met some people today, uh, yesterday in Highland Town. Is that where we were? Highland Town. Highland Town. I, went, I met one. You know, there was a woman that had to be just like this woman of a spirit of divination. She came up to me and she was yelling, do something about that church up the street. And she was swearing. Every other word was unbelievable. Her eyes were coming out of her head and she was frothing at the mouth. And I'm thinking, this is an interesting challenge. I think I sent it to somebody else. Somebody that was with me. I said, go talk to that person, would you? Wow, this is nuts, you know? Now, I don't think the Lord had opened her heart. No. She wanted me to do something about a church that she said was disrespectful to her. She said, what do you got those papers in your hand for? I said, I give them out the gospel. Then you can go correct that church. And every other word, like the vulgarity was unbelievable. I think you were there, Aya, weren't you? Yeah, I just was smiling. I think, wow, this is wonderful. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing this person today to teach me patience, unconditional love, and how not to strangle somebody. <laughs> how to restrain myself, you know? <laughs> oh, boy. It's interesting. I met but I met a number of people today whose heart the Lord opened uh, in the market. Anybody ever know where the market is? In the market, okay. I love the market. Because huh? you know what? It gives me a chance to keep going. I was thinking about it, that like you could, I don't care where you're at in your physical health, you could go down and just sit there. Sit there and just talk to people about Jesus. <laughs> One guy came out today and said, I bet you have more tracks than I do. He's the, you know, the guy that owns the liquor store? You know that guy? I think he's from Korea. He's from Korea. And I'm like, you got more tracks than I do. How about giving me some? Why don't you evangelize me? He just looked at me like. Anyway, but I love it. So if Paul faces these different situations. And obviously that woman with the spirit of divination, uh, there was no open heart there. What she needed was open heart surgery. She needed that one removed and God's heart put in, you know. But so this is the background of the book of the epistle to the Philippians. And this was really a very strategic city as far as being a Roman colony. It was really a, a place where many people passed through and very important in, in, the, in the plan of God. So we, we can just see the background here and they going from the church at Antioch and, and going out, second missionary journey, and it being an open door. It's second Corinthians 2.12 said, a door of the Lord of the gospel was opened unto me. I could preach there. He was talking. He said, this is an open door. Now, you would ask yourself a question. You're, you're dealing with that woman with a spirit of divination and going to jail. You call that an open door? That's an open door. Paul sees it as an open door. Sometimes we see difficulties as a closed door. Hello? Isn't that what happens sometimes? We see problems, difficulties, obstacles as the doors close when God's saying, this is a, an open door. Paul said, this is an open door. An open door. And I think it's awesome. So we see our, a, a church developed in the house. And even, the, don't you love the jailer? He says, come to my what? Come to my house. He had two house things going there in, in the uh, letter to... Uh, the Philippians, two house churches going on, one in the jailer's house and one in Lydia's house. They were just doing a house-to-house -house thing, which I think is really quite amazing. But, but think about this, about how they, they were just going. 
And as they were going, these opportunities would take place. All these situations, they would just be wide open. And I, and I think that God has so, I know that God has so many opportunities for us as believers. And he says that all you have to do is be a going person. Be a going person. And I will show you things. And, I, and you, things will take place. And uh, you will be amazed at what goes on. And a going church is going to have doors open to them all over the world. There's no doubt about that. A going church. And so going and never stopping. And you know, I'm not talking about going for five years, going for 10 years, going for 20 years. But if we're a Christian for 50 years, we just have this mental attitude about we're going to be what kind of people? Going people. People that are going. Not just going to church, but going out with the gospel, wherever God leads us and whatever takes place. Now, turn to Philippians chapter 1. Told you we'd get there. Didn't believe it, did you? By the way, Paul did make two trips to this city. Another one he made in, in uh, Acts chapter 20. Doesn't say exactly how long it was, but 20, Acts chapter 20, verses 1 and 6. And I also want to mention, before we look at Philippians, the team of people that Paul had that were traveling. And, I, and once again, we, we really understand the importance of team missions. Even if you're going to the beach, take a team. It's okay. You go there to evangelize, you know. I used to, I love the beaches in Ghana because nobody's there. And there's nobody in the water because of sharks. <laughs> Remember Pastor Ben? Mighty beach uh, with its cross currents that took people down and never were seen again. I had to stop going to the beach because every time someone was drowning, they would be yelling my name because I could swim. And you got to go out and bring people in. That's, and some, some people are heavy. <laughs> I remember one guy, I told the story before, I, you know, he was out there like, he was like a maniac. And he grabbed me and started pulling me under. I came up and the next I punched him right in the nose. And I, I broke his nose, but I knocked him out. And he was an easy dragon. That's what you need. You need to knock somebody out. Because I said, this guy is like out of his mind. This is not going to work, you know. I'm going to die here. This, thing, and this can't happen. So I don't even think he thanked me after. <laughs> when we got the shot, I don't even think he said like, thanks, you know, for saving my life. He was like, man, this is killing me. I'm like, at least you can feel it. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you're allowed to feel your nose, you know, hello. I, I, at one point, I stopped going to the beach because it was just too dangerous, you know. For me, I just said, I'm not doing that. Even Pastor Dwayne had to be saved. <laughs> he'll tell the story differently, too, you know. He'll say, he, no, he will, he'll say he was out saving somebody and then trying to save two people at the same time, and he was struggling, and I came out to help. No, no, it's not, it's not the case at all. Isn't that right, Pastor Ben? Huh? Pastor Ben is not saying anything. He doesn't want to... He doesn't want to incriminate his landlord. <laughs> yeah, twice? Yeah, I, got, I, I think I pulled you in once. Was it once, Pastor Ben? Two times I pulled you out of the water. Yeah, and you were heavy. <laughs> You're a strong guy, you know. Lifted, used to lift up all that concrete. I think, I'm not going back to the beach, you know. And you weren't even, in, the water wasn't even that high. It was just powerful, wasn't it? Very powerful water. Anyway, that's got nothing to do with Philippians at all. Right? <laughs> that, I can, that I can think of. Um, I forgot even what I was talking about. Do you remember what I was talking about? <laughs> the team, thank you. Wow, someone's got a better memory than me. I forgot just on purpose, no. Um, it's, it was just very interesting that you see Paul, a Tarsus-born Jew, moving with Silas, a Jerusalem Jew, they meet Luke, who's a total Macedonian, all right? And it's really interesting. Then they have, uh, they have Timothy, who's half Jew and half Greek, 
they meet Lydia, an Asian. Isn't that interesting? Like, isn't that amazing how God puts people together that are like so diverse? Paul, I think the reason why Paul, God allowed Paul to have a problem with Barnabas is he wanted to attach to Paul a Jerusalem Jew, born again. I think Barnabas was a, was a, a Cypriot, right? We have people from Cyprus here tonight, right? But I think at some point, because of the problems that Paul had had with Jerusalem, he was going to connect Paul with a Jerusalem Jew, born again. And that was Silas. And so you get a Tarsus-born Jew, a Jerusalem Jew, a man who is half Jew, half Greek, Timothy, and then Luke the Macedonian, who is just totally all Gentile all, all the way. And then they meet Lydia, who is a, a seller of purple in Asia. And this shows you the diversification that if every one of them is looking to Christ for their sufficiency, it doesn't matter where you come from. You don't, you're not nationalistic in any way, you know. Uh, there's no prejudice in there at all. And it's amazing. because that's, And that's a problem. It was a problem for Peter. Peter had problems along those lines, you know. He, wouldn't, he didn't want to go in with, with a Gentile, Cornelius, remember? Remember God said, kill an eagle is not so. I mean, he's got a vision. He tells God no. <laughs> Paul says go. Peter says no. That was really interesting to me, you know. And he was showing him something in that vision of the importance of body life. And so in Acts 16, this was a very unique team that went out. Now, this, and this really signifies the sufficiency of Christ, the all-sufficiency of Christ. Now, I want to give you some verses on the sufficiency of Christ, starting in just in the epistle. And we're going to see a number of major thoughts that run through this epistle. And we'll see them in the course that we take in the next 10 classes. And one of them is the mind of God. We'll be teaching about the grace mind next week, every morning from 10.30 to 12. Uh, right, I think it's right here in this room. If you, have, if you have nothing to do, come. If you have something to do, come. If you should be doing something else, come. <laughs> Whatever, I'm just joking. You got that, Jim Markowski? Are you with me? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Pretty, only pretty much, huh? That's good. All right. But there's a, there's, a, there's a line that runs through the epistle, and it's about the mind of God. It occurs 26 times, mind or understanding or knowledge. 26 times in the epistle, it talks about God's mind in some fashion, some measure or fashion. And then 19 times in the epistle, it talks about joy. Like how many of you can put one and one together and come up with two? Huh? One, the mind of God. Two, the joy of God, right? I mean, you put them together. If you've got God's mind, you're going to have joy. If you don't have God's mind, you're going to be miserable. All right? So you see the mind of God right through the whole four chapters. You see joy spoken of like in no other epistle, the joy of God. And then you see the sufficiency of Christ, which we will look at right now, the, the all-sufficiency of Christ. And by the way, they had to understand the sufficiency of Christ because they were in a serious trial. Can I give you a little background on what was going on there? Just for your information, you probably know this, but if you don't, to say the same things is not grievous. Philippians 3.2, 2 Peter 1.12. Okay? Dr. Stevens used to say we need to hear something 35 times before we get it. At least 35 times before it sinks in. Now, in the church at Philippi, their pastor teacher was dying. Epaphroditus was sick and dying. And that's in Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 through 30. He risked his life for the gospel, and it brought him in a health condition that he was near death. Okay? And Paul said, thank you, God, that you spared him and me. Because I don't know what we'd have done without him. Epaphroditus. And even he made the journey to the Apostle Paul. See Paul. But their pastor teacher was not physically well. All right? Number two, their apostle was in jail. That's encouraging, huh? Man that plants the church is in prison. Number three, they were being persecuted by the Roman government. They were, they were in a Roman colony, and that meant everything negative about Rome was against them. Number four, they had to face 
the opposition of the wisdom of the age of the Greek culture. The wisdom that God called foolishness. So there was the attack against the word by people who thought they were wise. Are you with me? Number four, the Judaizers, the Jews, were dogging them. Paul called them the dogs of the concision. He, would, he didn't mix words with them and say, just a bunch of, bunch of misinformed people. He called them dogs. They were dogs. The dogs of the concision. Next problem, how many is that? It's only five? What's wrong with you? Five. Number six, there was some problems in the church between two women. Chapter four, verses one and one through three. There were two women that were fighting it out and causing a problem in the church. All right? Number six, there was a lack, seven? Seven, there was a lack of humility. Why do you think the whole kenosis explanation from Philippians chapter two, verses one through 10, about the humility of Christ? There was pride there. There was a lot of natural pride that was existing there. All right, pride. And so he talked about the humility of Christ. So there's, there were so many things going on there. So many things going on. Maybe if there was financial situations that were occurring. Paul himself was in great need, but was very thankful for the only church that really gave to him and helped him out. But you just, just look at that. There was people who were looking at uh, their gain in their flesh. When Paul said, I count all things but a loss, except for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. People pursuing things that they should not have been pursuing. So you could see the, the pagan idolatry that was there and all that was going on. Now Paul is going to talk to them and write to them and preach to them and teach them about the sufficiency of Christ. And isn't that the way it is in our lives today? Like whatever culture we may be in and where we may be from, we get so focused on all the problems and not on the sufficiency of Christ. Are you with me? Hmm? No sleeping. Why would I say that? I won't tell you. The sufficiency of Christ. It's not about who wins the election, it's the sufficiency of Christ. It's not about gas prices, it's the sufficiency of Christ. It's not about drug addiction in Baltimore, it's the sufficiency of Christ. It's not about crime, it's the sufficiency of Christ. It's not about marriage problems and situations that are going on, it's all about the sufficiency of Christ. This is the key. So no matter what is going on all around us, Paul is saying, listen, I want you to understand the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. And if I am focused on that, these other things, yes, they're there and they may not go away, but I bring he who is the sufficient one into them. Are you with me? And they are not, they do not become God, but God is God to me in those things. And I love it. I, I think uh, Pastor Tohir, is he here? Where is he? Yes. I think when I called you up, remember, I, I think I called you on the phone and, and I knew about your situation in Turkmenistan. Uzbekistan, I'm sorry. My God, I got my stands mixed up. <laughs> and uh, my thoughts to you was the sufficiency of Christ, right? What can we do about a, a government that's against the gospel? What can you do? What are you going to do, get a petition up? You're going to march on the Uzbek embassy? Huh? What are you going to do? You're going to look to God, right? What's going to take place, you know? Uh, and we have all these things that are going on all, all over the place, but I look at the sufficiency of Christ. You ever have a problem with another believer? Don't say it, because you never have. Rather than look at that person and their lack of sufficiency in whatever's going on, look at the sufficiency of Christ and realize that these are people Sinners saved by grace, and if you're finding, your, if you're deriving your sufficiency from them, you've got a problem. You've got a problem. I would hear this sometimes, like, you know, I don't understand why something more didn't happen from Baltimore or from this base of operation when it comes to me planting a church in Africa. Are you looking to Jesus or are you looking to me? When did I become God? What are you, nuts? Huh? Are you crazy or something? Is your sufficiency of God? Or is it of, you know, 
the church or the church's ability to fund you or support you or whatever it may be or the church didn't do this and the church didn't do that and maybe the church didn't do it just so you could grow in the sufficiency of Christ. How's that one, huh? Sometimes people come in with problems and God doesn't give a pastor an answer. Then don't give him one. Don't make up an answer to appease somebody just because you think you have to have the answer because you're a pastor. You got to have the answer. Have them look to Christ, right? Sufficiency is of God. Sufficiency is of God. And this is so important. And this is what he had to teach these Philippians, and this is what they needed to learn, and this is what they needed to grow in. He just kept elevating Christ, and we can see it in these verses. Look at verse 1. Just, just going to give you some verses about the sufficiency of Christ. Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of who? Of Jesus Christ. To all the saints who are what? In Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. He says we're servants of Jesus Christ and we're speaking to people who are in Christ. This is all about Jesus Christ. It's not about a denomination. It's not about, it's not about a group of people first. Thank God for the church, but it's all about Christ. We are the servants of Jesus Christ, and we're speaking to people who are in Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus and him alone. And they saw who on the mountain? Jesus only. He's saying right from the, right from the beginning in the first verse, it's we are servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints who are in Jesus Christ. And that's amazing. Who is the principal focus in verse 1? Christ. Jesus Christ. Whatever happened to God? You see churches and movements today and missions organizations. And my question is, whatever happened to God? Where'd God go in all this? It's also humanly orientated. It's also based upon human ability, human tradition, human thinking, human evaluation, and human works. Where's God in all of this? It's really good to remember who saved you. Isn't that good? Really, they always reflect back on that, that I was saved by Jesus Christ. So the sufficiency of Christ. Then he says in verse 2, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Three times he mentions the name Jesus Christ in the first, the opening line here. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Verse 6. Being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of the next election. <laughs> until the day you die. Until there's no social security left. <laughs> Somebody said to me, I gotta collect now because you know what, the way things are going, there may not be any money. Who cares? What do I care? Remember I said the other night, you can eat tree bark. You take bark <laughs> off a tree, you, you get a pot, you boil water and there's a lot of nutrients in tree bark and, and what's underneath there. Ask the Sudanese. If Muhib was here, he would tell you. Is he here? He's not here. But. Tree bark. The sufficiency of Christ. Are you living for social security or are you living in eternal security? Huh? I'm eternally secure. God's going to supply. And when God doesn't supply and uh, it's bye-bye for me, whatever, who cares? Like, is there so much here that you want to hang on to? Huh? <laughs> Some of the younger people are going, huh? What are you saying? I'm not ready to go yet. I'm not saying you are, but I'm just saying, you know what? Who's going to perform it? Who began it? Who's going to perform it? You know, we have a real problem. It's called, uh, somebody once said, I think it was, uh, Oswald Chambers, we get muddled in the middle. What does it mean to be muddled and muddied in the middle? God begins it and we perform. We get muddled in the middle. I like Romans 11, verse 35 and 36. It's of him and through him and to him be the glory. Everything is of him, everything is through him, so the glory goes to him. 
This is all about God. And you know what? When you understand the sufficiency of Christ, you relax. There's peace. There's contentment. There's joy. It's like, you know what? Like, no matter what happens, you can't take Jesus from me. Amen? I have Christ. Can you take him from me? You cannot. I can't take him from myself. All right? I've got Christ, and I'm confident of this one thing, it says in the Greek language. Being confident of this one thing, that he who began a good work in you will what? Perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's the sufficiency. He does the performing of the Christian life. A lot of times people get saved and they say, I'm, I'm gonna, I perform. I'm going to make this work. Huh? And they always misquote that verse, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, but they forget the next part. For it is God who both worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's God who's doing the work. The sufficiency of Christ. Verses 14 through 16. He's talking about is Christ preached? Is Christ preached? This is the key. Is Christ preached? Preaching Christ. Preaching Christ, verse 15. Preaching Christ, verse 16. Who do, what do we do when we go out there and talk to people? Are we preaching ourselves? Are we preaching our church? Are we preaching Christ? Preaching Jesus Christ. Because he's the only one that can save them. He saves them. Verse 21. This is just on the sufficiency of Christ. Are you with me? For to me, I just like how this reads. For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. For to me, to live is Christ. For to you, what? Huh? To live is? Yeah. But if it's, there's a lot of things that people put in there. For me to live is getting married. For me to live is making money. For me to live is to have kids. For me to live is to get healed. For me to live is to make money. For me to live is to be popular. For me to live, no. The sufficiency of Christ. For me to live is what? Christ. For me to live is Christ, Paul says. And to die is what? Amen. By the way, the devil has a fear of what's going to happen to him at the end. That's why he perpetrates the fear of death on people. He knows what's happening. See, the one who produces fear, fears. Never forget, he fears. He knows what he is but a short time. So there's a, he knows what's going to happen. So the one who produces fear, Hebrews chapter 2, 14, 15, he fears. So he produces who he is all over the place. But for me, what? To live is what? Is Christ. Verses 26 and 27. That your rejoicing may be more abundant. What's your rejoicing in? Jesus Christ. My rejoicing is in Jesus Christ. Verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of? Of Christ. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. It's all about Jesus Christ humbling himself and being obedient to death even the death of the cross. Those 11 verses all exalt the humility of Jesus Christ. In chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, we are lights in this world holding forth the word of life. Okay? The sufficiency of Christ for us to be lights in this world. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ. Okay? Chapter 3, verse 1, rejoice in Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 3, rejoice in Jesus. Chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, and we're going to go through this, but he says, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, of whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. This is Christ. In verse 14, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. In Christ. 318, they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord 
always again I say rejoice. Chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which what? Strengthens me. And finally in verse 19, my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. So what is Paul doing through the epistle? Showing the what? Sufficiency of Jesus Christ. And that's the key. Father, thank you for this half of the class. Bless us as we go into the break. In Jesus' name, amen. Come back at 8.15.